right. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to take the MC honors uh, very humbly today. Uh, my name is Marc Gardipi. I am from a consultant from RECI. Uh, I have two of my colleagues here, Emily Bowles and Giovanna Savaggio. We're here to, uh, to talk to you a little bit about uh, what's going to go on today. We're really going to try to turn, um, uh, turn, I don't want to say turn the tables, but turn everything towards you, turn the cameras towards you and have you participate as much as possible and communicate with one another as much as possible. Uh, and things do continue to evolve. So when you leave us comments uh, at the end of the hour, there will be an exit slip and we, we, or a ticket. We would like you to fill it in. We take it to, to account. Uh, we read them all and then we try to adapt depending on your needs and wants and desires. Um, so uh, we asked you to your favorite way to start online. Well, uh, we got some great responses. And as I was saying before, it's really nice to see that we're trying to take care of one another. And it's not just about teaching, it's also about reaching out and, and just uh, finding out how people are doing. And uh, I think that's great. Um, so today we're gonna have subject specific breakout rooms and I'm gonna leave the uh, explanations of that to Emily. I'm gonna maybe send out a few messages to you, but that'll be about it. So go ahead, Emily. Okay. All right, um, so I am going to share a collaborative document with everybody. Um, I've created sections in this collaborative document for each of the subject specific breakout rooms that we are gonna have for you today. And the reason we created this collaborative document is to make it easy for us to share our ideas, share any resources we found or that we've created that we have um, found to be really helpful. Um, so this collaborative document will be available to for us today to keep track of what's going on and for people who aren't able to be with us here today so they can um, take a look at it later on at their convenience. So all you would need to do, depending on which section, let's say I wanna to go to the DBE English section, I click it, it'll redirect me. Um, and once again, if you're not sure how to join a Zoom breakout room, there's a little link to some uh, visuals right there. All right, so I'm gonna open up those breakout rooms for us so we can get chatting. Open all rooms, so now that should show up for you at the very bottom. If you're having any trouble, Mark is gonna be here to help you out with the breakout rooms. I'm gonna be joining a breakout room. See you at the end. So yeah, like how are you, did you set up a Google Classroom for each of your um, things that you're teaching? So at the moment we, um, our board back, when we shut down the first time in the spring, we decided to go with Moodle. So we started with Moodle. Um, the teachers have kind of, you know, put together their, like they've all been given their own little classrooms and stuff, rooms on Moodle and whatever. Okay. Yeah. So we've been doing it. But right now we're trying to get all of the, like the English teachers all in line for the whole, our whole board so that are, because we're having problems with students coming who want to come into the center like one day and want to be online <laughs> three days. And so right now we're trying to align it that we're all going to do some of the base stuff the same. And so we're trying to create base Moodle cor courses on Moodle that are base that everyone will use and then we'll just supplement with our own particular materials like the in. Okay. We so we're not trying to like make everybody do the same thing you know completely but we are trying to work together and get on the same page and and how are you finding like the 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 students and the teachers liking moodle um actually not too bad the, i think the teachers it's a it's a little bit of a learning curve at first yeah but we had um uh, we did some training and the training went really good and same thing with our school board decided that we would be teaching the students before they got online. Uh, so we set up a local computer course and every student who comes into the board pretty much goes through me. That's my main task this year is I'm teaching the computer course. So I'm teaching all the students who come through uh, our center, um, all the tools that they're gonna need 
to be able to get in Moodle, get online, you know, the Zoom, uh, yeah. you know, Google Docs, uh, all of that stuff. So you're, so um, how are you doing, are you, how are you doing the virtual, like the virtual classroom? Like Zoom. Zoom, okay, yeah. Zoom. Yep, yep. Are you online, teaching online or are you? Yeah, so I'm, customer? I'm doing an option course, which is 100% online. Okay. Um, and then I'm doing the sec, the sec threes, which uh, they want to be a hundred percent online. They don't want to come in except for exams. Okay. So okay. we're doing Google classroom. Are I do YouTube? prefer zoom like the, for the virtual like zoom, just because the breakout rooms are easier. Okay. Yeah. I love the breakout rooms. The breakout rooms are by, by far, like what yeah. makes the online work. Yeah. Cause at first, when I first started teaching online, like I'd have everybody in the main room and, you know, if I'd ask a question, I get very little blah, blah, blah response. And then when I started, finally, I start with like a couple of minutes with everybody and, you know, give out my instructions for the day and whatever. And then I basically ask people, I say, okay, who wants help right now? Yeah. I'll come to you first and then I'll be around and circulate. And I get so much more response from them. They, they don't want to talk in a large group, especially oh, online. They're totally... So having that uh, now, it, it really, uh, really helps out. Yeah. I'm going to try, I'm going to try doing like a Zoom breakout room for the third part of Sec 3, because um, there's more discussion about like advertisements yeah. and, 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 and those things and learning all, all the, all the terms and all the, yeah, all the, the advertisements. So I, I would, I'm going to, I'm going to try that breakout, like using Zoom as in addition, because Google Classroom, like, like it's fine. It's fine. It's just the, um, to create breakout rooms in Google Classroom, it takes like half an hour. Wow. Yeah, it took me. Yeah, I've never used it for that. So it takes me about half an hour. It might take somebody a bit less if they're like experienced, but because you have to assign all the things and then you have to give and then switching back and forth is a bit. It works. Yeah, on, on Zoom, it's pretty easy. Yeah. I have to say it's it's pretty darn easy. And we had hoped that that was coming with Google Classroom, but it's a long time coming. Mm -hmm. So people are, so using Zoom is perfectly legitimate as well. Um, some students are um, reluctant to use Zoom. Okay. Because they've heard all these um, oh, like yeah, privacy, yeah. like privacy, uh, when I first started teaching the course, I heard a lot about that too. And, you know, I got all the documents on it and said, okay, look, this is what they've done. Like now it's pretty whatever. So now I don't get that too much. We anymore. actually had it with meat because at first, unless you got in there first, any, the person who got in first was the one who controlled the meeting. And, uh, and now at least they put some safeguards in place where you can make sure that uh, you don't get meat bombed. But that was interesting. Yeah. So Shanna, how do you manage teaching? You know, it's a very different teaching situation where you are, where you have so many different courses uh, versus, you know, Hannah, you're able to focus on the one core, although you have more than one course, the one English course and yeah. focus on that. It's, it's in such different environments. Like how do you each do say secondary three? What would it look like in each version of what you guys do? Well, I mean, my, my version is basically for me going online wasn't a, a stretch from my individualized classroom, right? I've never had the luxury of having like a whole, you know, sec three only, you know, one course going at a time. I've always had all three courses going and I would just pick, um, I would just pick, you know, today, okay, I'm going to, you know, give these guys a mini lesson on this and these guys a mini lesson on that. It's a little harder, like at least in the classroom, I did have like only the sec two, three. So I only had two levels. Um, but now both of you find the breakout room, whether it's easier to facilitate with Zoom or not, um, is a good strategy to get more people talking and engaging. 
Yeah. So they talk, they talk better if they're in a smaller group, like if you yeah. have a little group and you're all working on the same thing, as opposed to when they're all like when I've got, you know, 20 students all in one room, they don't, they're, they're too shy. They don't want to talk. They don't want to. So putting them in, whether it's their own individual rooms or little groups or whatever works far better. I mean, I have students that I'd had for a while that I could barely get to talk in class that now on online and in a breakout room, I'll, they'll, they'll chat away. They don't have to have their camera on. They can just put their audio on. And because I can't see them, it's like they, they'll just talk and they'll, you know, it's not great for everyone. I mean, uh, there's others that it's the opposite and they're not getting work done and they were when they were in the center, but for some, it's been a really good thing. You, Hannah? Um. I, I, I thought my sec threes are pretty chummy with each other and I'm having like, a, um, they're good, but I find that like some are more chatty than others. And if I do a breakout room, as long as I like structure the student, like I, I, I pick and choose who goes where, like strategically. So normally I put like people that are not too chummy together because then they'll dominate with their personal life yeah. so but I tend to put like a strong person in each group and then kind of yeah nothing different than what we do in the classroom exactly it's really exactly. nothing I mean so, it's knowing your knowing your students and knowing what they're going to do and that and uh, as long as I provide like a gu like guiding questions um and say I'm going to check on you and like have them have a place to write their answers. So like I open up like a collaborative Google slide and then each slide is like per group. So you'll have like them writing what they said. I know you guys have shared material for sec oh. three in particular. Um, so I just, I'm taking a few notes as I listen to you and just, um, you know, in terms of the material for the different um, modules that are involved, how do you, what do you guys each do to uh, help, despite the curriculum in the Sec 3 English program, uh, help develop the skills your students need to be successful in Sec 4 and Sec 5? Great question. Well, honestly, the Sec 3 is kind of like a, a little, it's just a, Sec 3 is just plopped in there and it really doesn't attach to the SEC 4 or 5. It really doesn't. It's like this own little entity, right? So the SEC 3, they just have to get through it. I mean, the first one is the interviews in that. So it's trying to find interviews that they're going to be interested in and want to want to analyze and whatever. So I mean, that's, uh, and then they have to conduct their own little interview. So whatever. Um, and what do you, what yeah. do you use? What's a good source for you, Shanna, for uh, engaging? Well, into I've just, I've kind of, I've kind of plucked a few things off, off of uh, just general uh, interviews, like uh, at the moment that I'm using with, with the students, like, I think I have one on uh, interviewing uh, Malala's father. I have like, there's obviously a Chris Hadfield because he's been on and has like tons of them. Um, there's a Clara Hughes. There's uh, I have a Maya Angelou one that's a little more on the serious side uh, as well to give them a variety of, you know, more entertainment ones uh, more versus, you know, a more serious, uh, serious ones. I, I think I need to get a I have to find I want to find a, like a more political one. I, I just showed one for the exam. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in teaching about themes, like when you say Gail connecting to SEC 4, I, I try to uh, introduce my students to themes, right? The theme, try to find the theme of the interview. What is a theme? If you can't find a theme, start with a topic. What's the topic about? Um, so I found that by doing the interview on their exams, I found a lot of them were able to pick out the topics like struggle, um, perseverance, and then from that, from those topics, find a theme and then be able to connect to it. And like a lot of people can't necessarily connect to like an alcoholic family member or, or being like sexually abused. 
but they can kind of connect with feelings and maybe they can like have empathy or maybe they have people in their life or will have people in their life that will connect to these things. So I think the theme, the theme, the overall themes of like interviews in the first section is a really good way to connect to sec four. And it's so challenging. That's one of the create. things that I find is really challenging online. Yeah. It's creating that uh, because there is like in the classroom, there, there's nothing between you and the student, but in the online, you know, it, it, it takes a little while longer to, you know, develop the rapport with them, to develop yeah. uh, the links with them. So and the that, interviews are really, I find if you have like a diverse type of interview, you're, you're more, and, and you have like questions, like how can you connect to this? And, and, and what are the themes? Like you can really connect with yeah. your students that way. Yeah, so uh, it's, uh, it's- And how do you, how does it manifest? Cause I know one of the real limitations and concerns is the lack of real writing and reading and the different dimensions of English that are developed in the SEC3 program, right? Because you're focusing on interviews and mm -hmm. persuasive techniques and you know uh, job uh, orientation. So how do you bring in the reading and writing that they need to develop, to become proficient and succeed in SEC4 and SEC5? So in the first part of SEC 3, I have the biographies. I found, like I'm registered to ESL Library and on ESL Library, they have like hundreds of biographies of people. Um, so I chose the ones that are more challenging and difficult and I downloaded them into a PDF file and I saved them in the drive. Um, so they would read the biography, like they can read numerous biographies as a practice um, and then write like interview questions. But uh, I think if I were to do, I would do this course again, I might do something like more with the biographies, like more of a summary or a connection type piece or why did you choose this person? Yeah, adding that in could help. Yeah. I think in the, in this, in the uh, last one, um, I, I started using um, a couple of harder, like things to introduce them to the idea of advertising and what it does and, and then, and, and the techniques of advertising. So um, that's where I really up the ante with their reading and responding and actually understanding their yeah. what they were reading because uh, one of the one of the articles that I have it's a, it's a, about uh, the Museum of Failed Products and it oh. talks about how you know, you see how how you can see different things like these products failed but there's a lot of things that we can learn from it and it's talking about how we see failure in society and that we shouldn't see failure as um as a bad thing it's and they liken it to like uh bodybuilding doesn't That's mean that because cool. you can't lift the weights in the beginning it doesn't mean you failed it means you keep pushing yourself so that you can do more and more and more so um, yeah, that's one of the ways is just introducing some of the readings that are at a higher level that are using, uh, you know, um, more sophisticated, that are, are much more sophisticated to, uh, to bump that up a notch. Is this actually a website, the Museum of Failed Products? No, it's an actual, it's an actual place. It's, oh. it's a place in New York and it's, um, it was just an article. I forget what it what it's called. Um, Happiness is a glass half full or something. It's an article okay. uh, by maybe David Burke or something. Anyways, uh, and it's a it's it's a hard one. Like I do it with the students, and and you know we work on reading strategies and how you you know decipher this text because it is actually quite hard. But the messages in it are really good. 
and it well, links directly into the advertising and stuff. So, oh, that's really an interesting segue. The other thing is, both of you attended Wendy King's sessions oh. on reading strategies. How do you, um, or do you like, how do you incorporate the strategies that you pick, you know, and some of which you were already very familiar with? How do you implement reading strategies? I still use the start, start, stop, and think. Was it start, stop, start, stop, and think? So like um, either paragraph by paragraph or line by line. I still, I still use that. Um, I use the, the five senses. So when you're reading something, what are like the five senses? That's more sec four though. I do that, the sense thing yeah. in, in sec four for poetry. Um, but the start, stop, continue, the defining terms. I do a lot in SEC 3. We do lots of defining terms. Yeah, when it, breaking down, like say that that harder one, um, sometimes I'll, I'll put the notes on the side and then we'll have some of those, those cues that Wendy had given us and say, okay, well, maybe here is where you need to infer. You know, here you might need some background knowledge. Here you might need some, you know, and, and kind of try and model it because it doesn't come naturally necessarily to them so um, in harder text than that it's really trying to you know what these are the things that good readers do and you need to pay attention and, and trying to develop it with them and is it okay um, or useful to talk to teach reading strategies in an explicit way can you say that again to teach reading strategies in an explicit way so that you're actually telling them this is a reading strategy so that they're aware of which they become aware of their toolkit of strategies and what to use when. Do either of you conscientiously do that? Yeah, I tell them we're doing this. I tell them we're doing star stop oh, continue. Yeah, you have to. Why. You yeah. have to because yeah. they're not going to pick it up on their own. Yeah. Like, it's, 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 you know, like here, these, these are the things we're gonna use so that you get them into your toolbox and you start using them. It's not like, if I just show them and they don't actually have to use them and they don't even know why they're using them, they're, they're, they're not gonna to gravitate towards it after. So it's good for they them to, to be able to actually, actually identify. something. It, they need to see that it actually adds something to their reading, right? Like that they're gonna get more out of it. Yeah, and, and, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I tend to be like, honest with my students saying like, I'm not a good reader. I'm an English teacher and I'm not a good reader. So I have to like, and by the time, and, and like I wasn't taught these reading strategies. And by the time I went to university, I really struggled with reading scholarly articles because I, I couldn't break it down. I couldn't, I would read the same sentence over and over and over again. So like these reading strategies like really helped me develop the way that I read and the way that I can understand and extract information, because by the, if you're cho choosing to move on, you know, you're going to do a lot of reading in your life in CJEP, in university, and using these tools is just going to make you engage with the material better and save you time and save you frustration and anxiety. And in your experience with your students, there's the reading aspect well, there's comprehension, there's speaking, there's reading, there's writing. Um, which do you think is most valuable when it comes to developing writing skills? How do you, how do you work on developing those writing skills? I'm struggling with that. I find that my students are constantly asking for grammar, 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 and I tell them no. I'm telling them that we do grammar within within the, the, the writing. I'm not going to give you a necessarily explicit grammar lesson on its or how to, how to write uh, this past continuous. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Um, Are many of those students um, not English as first language students, Hannah, the ones who yeah. are asking for grammar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I tell, I tell them that we have to practice writing and, the, and, and they have to hand stuff in. Like they, they, I can give an assignment, but if they don't hand it in, 
and they don't do it, how can I see what they need? But I'm struggling with the writing aspect. Well, it's hard because it's hard in the sec three. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's, there's not enough of it in the sec three to really, really, really work on it very hard. You know, like uh, it's, it, it is, it's not built in into the program. So you're kind of bound and you can't, uh, the sad part is, is that, you know, these students are trying to get on and, and move forward and whatever. So like you need to you need to get the program done for them um, so that they can move on and and it, it's it's just sad that it's not more there's not more of it in the program so that you can actually you know really focus on it so how do you develop the reading and writing skills in sec 4 and sec 5 what is what do you find is most useful The questions that come along with the with the texts, yeah. The, the the idea that you're reading poetry and that you can really expand on the poetry, having a lot reading log, or a journal. The responses. Yeah. No, it's the responses and the things you can actually you know pick some of them and say okay this one we're gonna work on you know at the same time there's just more writing involved mm -hmm. like because they're responding to much more than they are in the sec three, so. Uh, there, there's, and there's, there's multiple, like there's, you're getting at it from different angles too. So it's not like just one type of writing you can, there, there is more and there's more types of reading and you are reading more and you are doing more than the sex read. Like, it's just, it's not even, uh, there's no comparison really. And that's what they need. So ideally, what do you think would be a much better way to design the SEC 3 program to make the SEC 4 and SEC 5 more doable for our students? Keeping the same material, like keeping the same kind of theme, like interviews and... No, just generally speaking, like, you know, what there isn't now that there could be, um, like, what is it that they need in SEC 3 more than what they're getting now? I would love to have them engage with short stories. Mm. I think I think like short stories and, and about theme, because when you get to sec four, the first thing you're asked to do is like analyze the theme of a poem, like analyze the 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 way it's written and analyze the theme. And like students have a hard time with that coming from sec three. So I think that introducing theme. And like more like the, what's the moral of the story and what's the lesson and introducing connection like how can you connect to it is would be a great way to in, to to help their comprehension skills help their writing skills and help them ident like see themselves within the, the story and it will help them kind of understand sec four and sec five better is is there any way really, you could I, go ahead i agree with hannah and i think it goes further that you they need to be exposed to all the different types of you know all the purposes for reading and writing and and kind of go through them um in the sec three like they should be doing a little bit of you know the novel study they should be doing a little bit of you know the persuasive stuff which they are in the set in the third one but okay. they're not doing the writing part they're not doing the the you know they're they're not doing enough of it in there and you know you're informative and you know starting into your research papers and and things like that because it's a it's a it's pretty stark going from you know you haven't seen anything you know in those realms and then you know you're doing critical essays and and stuff like that and you had you you weren't really introduced to you know um research and stuff like that so. is there is there any room in the sec three curriculum because i know you know i had one teacher introduce a short novel and hannah you're talking about the sec three um short stories like is there any room to be able to fit anything like that in in the current restrictions we have with the sec three curriculum 
Well, I've done like uh, reading a short novel and then doing an advertisement for it. You can like stretch done- it, but yeah. it takes a while to do it. And yeah. like the, the, you know, if you're, you're bound by, you know, the hours that you're supposed to be doing it and, uh, you know, uh, getting them on board to, you know, like you're caught between a rock and a hard place, you know what they need and you know what you would like to do, but the program doesn't necessarily lend itself well to doing it. And there's also, you know, the, the students learning and the difficulties and things in there. And sometimes, you know what, some of them, they, you know, they're having troubles just getting through, you know, what's there and that. So adding that on top of it for a lot of them is just like, whoo, right? Whereas if you, if you had the leeway, like if it was written right into, and that's what you were working on for your program, oh, that's different, right? Like. Sometimes I think like, with 3101 and 3102, like they're so similar. Like they're so similar with, <sighs> even my students are like, miss, why are we doing this again? Why are we doing this again? We just did it. I wonder if it's like, well, what do they need more in life to be able to analyze videos, like analyze interviews, or do they need to know how to write a CV and a cover letter and interview? Like, I think they need to learn how to, like I, I, I actually enjoy the CV and cover letter. I, I, uh, and they're enjoying it too. They're learning about tips and like, uh, I just learned now you don't put your, your address anymore. And an ad, if putting your address on a CV and putting your address on a cover letter can be a deterrent. So like all the like new, new things, like I think it's, helpful but the yeah if anyone even know. reads them anymore <laughs> it's 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 sad but true I know. hi george it's, I didn't it's, even it's know becoming you. obsolete yeah it they are kind of becoming obsolete because i watched my kids go through the process and it's like they were lucky if they got a response in the old and, way of doing things and to be honest three th- th- uh, 3103 is becoming a little obsolete too because in a few years like commercials are three seconds long and and it's all about digital digital marketing you know like half my students don't have tv and, and, and like, finding other perfect? ways other ways to uh persuade right versus yeah. i mean you're not you're not you're not a captive audience that has to watch a 30 second slot during a program anymore. It's, it, it doesn't even fit. I, yeah, it's interesting. Most people don't program. even watch the commercials anymore. Like, yeah. seriously. I, except like, for the Super Bowl. <laughs> yes, yeah, except for the Super Bowl. Yeah. So, anyways, I was just saying that I do agree that there is a disconnect between 3101 and 3102. Not that it's not practical and useful for the students but there is a disconnect between those two courses and the rest of the program, definitely. And it's one that doesn't help the students because of the reality of our program, which is one, exam-oriented, 100%, uh, two, super fast-paced, and three, very weak students. So it's the perfect combination for a terrible storm, <laughs> terrible storm. We're not help- we, we are working with the most vulnerable students and we're not helping them. Like the number of times that I have voiced this at the ministry to the point that they already just don't wanna to listen to me anymore. Cause I've been saying, guys, we have to get rid of hundred percent exams over and over and over again. Now, are you working on design? Are you working with the ministry now, George? Well, this year, everything was put on hold because okay. of the pandemic, but yeah, we, we have a few exams, but even though it's funny because I am actually sort of leading the team that is designing the exams, but I don't believe that exams should be 100%. And one of the things that we've been saying at the board, at the ministry is we need to change the program. The program is good. The program is uh, a great improvement from whatever was there before, but we need to really tighten the program in a few places. I would just you know? love to be able to like have English, an English program that is developmental to get them you know, learning the stuff that they have, but that allows us to like impart our love of the language. Like there's so much stuff that I'd love to, you know. And there's no time, eh? 
and there's no time and there's no place to really fit it in. And it would just be, I mean, how much, how much nicer would it be for a student to walk into a classroom and be with a teacher and just say, okay, these are, you know what, in this one, we have to use these literary elements and we have to learn about this and persuasion and we everything, have to learn about this Shannon, and be free ev to. Everything that is fun that they Enjoy. do in the youth sector, everything that is fun and that is, that is done in the youth sector, we can't do because no. we always have the exam right there. Yeah. The exam's coming up, the exam's coming up. And in some boards, they actually do 150 hours, but there are boards where they don't even offer the 150 hours. So uh, it's yep. uh, fast paced, yeah. Cameron from RSD, <laughs> tell me about contemporary world. Well, from what I understand, it, it's a very overwhelming course to, um, to teach, especially at first it's like they give you directives. It's like, here's current events and go and divide it into five categories. And you're like, what? So you have to understand what is it exactly I'm teaching them. So the obvious thing is you go to the exams and you look for that, but that's not really profound. So I went back and I did some research in the youth sector and I got, the first thing I did was I got the textbook from the youth sector in 2017 when I, uh, 18, when I debuted this course at, at Access. And I used that as the skeleton of my course in terms of the, the definitions and that. I didn't use the examples or the stats because if it's a textbook from 2007, it's not going to be very relevant in 2018 and 2021. The second thing I did to make it more relevant was, or to make it more, I, I, I agree and I'm sure a lot of adult ed teachers agree with me is that I'm sure everyone can agree that Diversity is important, especially given our student population. And the most successful way to make it relevant, they take this course as an alternative Canadian history because they want something that they find is uh, different, more relevant, mm -hmm. so make it relevant to them. Access, for instance, has a diverse, adult, every adult ed center seems to have uh, immigrant populations from a certain culture. Access in particular, it's Burundi, and Afghanistan, as well as various areas. So I use those places mm. when discussing issues. For instance, we're talking about wealth gap. Well, you don't have to talk about the wealth gap in North America, or, I mean, you can, but we've heard that. We've heard it in Canadian history. But what about talking about colonialism in Africa? Why is it that there's a wealth gap between Europe and Africa? Well, and the students feed into that because they recognize it. When you're talking about population, when you're talking about immigration and the troubles that immigrants face, you hand it over to the students. Well, what is the issues you faced? Are you an economic migrant or did you come here on family reunification? The third part is flexible learning spaces. Make them sit together. Now, obviously in COVID time, this is a very hard time. <laughs> Anyone who do that. But when it's in normal times, have them sit together in different groups and discuss the issues. Other things that you could have is a, my board was very not lucky enough to, uh, was very nice enough to present to me or to let me have in my classroom a giant map. I don't know if you've seen my classroom. I have, before. yeah, it takes up the <laughs> whole wall. Yeah, exactly. So that giant map is really, really, really useful especially when you're doing things like the NATO alliances and the Francophonia and all of the different types of alliances, when you go up there and each group has to do with a different sticky note, put the sticky note on the countries that are in NATO, put the this colored sticky note on the countries that are in the APEC or, uh, you know, and they get a visual of it. They get a visual of what's wrong with my map. Is Africa really smaller than Canada? No, why is it like this? And we can even discuss that. The last part is obviously in this day and age is having a sort of structure for them where they can find the notes, where they can find the PowerPoints, the basis. And that's where I use Moodle. Moodle is very useful for that. Um, for instance, if I was, I don't know if I can do this, share my screen. <laughs> Here's my Moodle for contemporary world. So as you can see, I have the theme with the money at the top. Nice. A video of how to use it. Um, the announcements. I have my Zoom code. That's no longer the Zoom code. So it's, <laughs> I've changed it for this semester. And I have my 
sections. Each section has different assignments, PowerPoints, warm up activities, and it goes through each one of the courses, uh, themes. What's really great about Moodle is when they submit assignments, you can actually pair it with the rubric. Emily, you were very yeah. doing that. <laughs> it was difficult to figure oh. out. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's, it's so useful. Hopefully you can't see my uh, messages with this. <laughs> no, 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 I can't. <laughs> so it was very, very useful to do that. Um, as you can see, population, wealth, environment, and then final exam prep. They don't get the final exam prep unless they've completed the learning situations for each one. So for population, their learning situation that we're working on right now is, is Canada's migrant system fair? In other words, is it fair to base someone's worth to Canada based on what they contribute? It's, is, is it outdated? Wealth, they have to discuss how we can we redu uh, reduce the, uh, the disparity of wealth between Africa and the West? What is it? So they have to look at colonialism. Obviously we can't undo that, but what we can do to bridge the gap. I talk about fair trade and what we can do to make life farmer. They get all the uh, life, farmers' lives better in these places. And it goes on and on. Environment, they have their own learning situation as well. For instance, what can you do to stop deforestation in the Amazon. Well, it looks simple on paper, but everything they learned from uh, reducing your beef consumption to not buying stuff with Nutella, like Nutella mm -hmm. can really help the environment. The last and final thing that I've had a lot, and I have, and I've included my email address on this. If anyone wants this, I've been building practice tests since 2017. So <laughs> I have practice tests and those are kind of essential for the document analysis part. For sure, of the yeah. Exam. The students find it um, particularly hard, that part, the document analysis. You, the essay, they're fine with. The oral, they're fine with. It usually carries them. But the S document analysis is very tricky. So to practice that over and over again, drill it with them using the Moodle, I find very useful. So that's been my experience. But again, the most important is really bring diversity and to bring their histories and to get to know their backgrounds when interested. Bring topics into the class that really interest the students. Don't just talk about Trump the whole time. Mm -hmm. I think that's <laughs> super important for contemporary world, especially because like, I mean, can, the events can get outdated so quickly that like it's important to yeah like that course will require like a lot of work in terms of keeping it up to date keeping it relevant and interesting but I mean at the same time it is such a great easy course for students to dig into because it is so inherently like interesting for yeah. sure yeah I think that's um, and we're really lucky in adult ed because we really get to work with uh people from here, but they get to meet people from around the world who have experienced these issues. And they, it's a, it creates a really good talk about inclusion and diversity. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the crowning gem of this. So those would be my six pointers. I think it was six on um, the world. <laughs> awesome. I wish, wish I had a picture to show you of my map and the students of uh, using the sticky notes, but I was told I only had five minutes. So I was just like, I'm just gonna talk. <laughs> <laughs> and so what about for history? What's it been like teaching history online? I'm on site. I'm not online, but when I've, okay. had, to, when I've had to go online, it's all right. It's okay. The one that's the hardest online is English. Hmm. Teaching students how to write online is hard. <laughs> hmm. One of the things that I've been thinking, that I've been seeing that's super cool online that I think could have worked really well for contemporary world mm -hmm. Um and history actually with the new curriculum that's coming and potentially English is teachers who are doing collaborative annotation activities. So like on Google docs or like the online version of Microsoft Word. So like they'll paste an article or something in um, Google docs or Microsoft Word online or in Google slides, they'll put an image on the slide and have students kind of like mark it up and comment on it and um, share kind of like trying to get those thinking, like what's going on inside their heads visible to everybody else and having students have a discussion around what they're noticing 
with like different discussion prompts to have them thinking more critically about what they're reading or what they're seeing and then applying that to um, like answering those questions, those intellectual operation questions and that we see in contemporary world and that we will also soon see in history where they kind of have to like phrase their response using those transitional words. Yeah, and the, the, the hardest uh, the hardest thing I find in contemporary world is getting them to not just copy the documents. Mm-hmm. They just copy the documents, the words, because they don't understand the question. And it's like, no, if you are copying the document, you're doing it wrong. So that's something I would like to know Hi, tips on. How do I get them to stop, to really like l- learn to respond to the inference, using the documents as an inference, but not to mm-hmm. copy them. That's the hardest part. And the fact that it's coming to history next year is mortifying. Mm. Um, by the way, though, in our recent newsletter for history, Paul Rumbo has been working on creating like a student facing site mm-hmm. um, for the new history curriculum. Let me just find the link here. Um, and I thought that that was kind of something that was interesting. So he has, he started, mm-hmm. he's not finished. He's got two of the different periods. And so then it would give like kind of like an overview of what each of the parts of the puzzle are. Oh, yes. Um, So it's got like an overall question. um, Uh, Some of those kind of learning. Now that I've come to think about it, I think Nicole has showed me this. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. He has like. That's amazing. And so then he has like little resources and then like an activity to, to, to go with each thing. Plus like the Récit Univers Social, Steve Quirion has been making so many excellent YouTube videos in French and Paul has started to translate them. Mm. Um, so that's pretty cool too. But he has like, he's got like tons. So he's like got all these like document collections, which, um, teachers can use as well. Oh, well. Because we're, we're gonna need to find our own documents to help students practice all of those things. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, I'm just dreading having to do those practice tests next year. Yeah, yeah. Plus like such- Especially considering you have to, especially you're not really supposed to use Google images, right? So it's like you have to find legit docs. Yeah. Again, the Récit Univers Social has like tons of stuff, but exactly, a lot of those primary documents, the written ones anyway, are all in French. Like the images we could probably use, but. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but he also has stuff for like the intellectual operations. So he's got some pretty cool stuff to check out. Okay, alors, oui? Oui, on parle. Alors, euh, on a choisi le thème euh, « Co-enseignement et évaluation en aide à l'apprentissage ». C'est des beaux mots pour dire quoi? Pour dire qu'on a décidé de travailler en équipe, Naomi et moi, pour euh, s'échanger du matériel, échanger sur nos pratiques, puis euh, venir en aide aux élèves du mieux qu'on pouvait. Donc, c'est de là que vient le mot « co-enseignement ». Ensuite, « évaluation en aide à l'apprentissage ». C'est super important de, de savoir aujourd'hui qu'on n'est pas là pour évaluer de façon sommative tout ce qu'on présente comme outil, comme solution, comme idée. Euh, c'est dans l'idée de, d'aider les élèves à euh, continuer leurs apprentissages puis à les rendre un peu plus euh, parfaits, tout simplement. Donc, c'est pour ça que c'est « en aide à l'apprentissage ». C'est du formatif de bord en bord. <rire> Donc, ce que je disais, on a choisi de parler de notre contexte de travail qui est euh, probablement aussi varié que tous les contextes qu'on peut retrouver à la formation des adultes, à l'éducation des adultes. Donc, d'abord, nous, on travaille dans un, une approche de suivi individualisé. Ça veut dire que dans notre classe, il y a des élèves de tous les niveaux de secondaire 1 à 5. Euh, en français, langue seconde. Ces élèves-là ont besoin d'un accompagnement spécifique. qui sont à des endroits différents aussi dans chaque euh, année de secondaire. 
En plus de ça, euh, on nous a euh, proposé de faire des classes en hybride. Donc, ça veut dire qu'on a des corps physiques humains présents dans notre classe et en même temps, des élèves en virtuel, en Zoom. Ensuite, le contexte, c'est aussi des élèves qui n'ont pas toujours le temps d'être là toute la semaine. Donc, ils sont parfois présents euh, deux jours semaine, trois jours semaine, donc à temps partiel. Et finalement, l'éducation aux adultes, c'est aussi parfois, souvent, je dirais, des besoins particuliers. Donc, ce n'est pas des besoins, c'est des élèves à besoins particuliers. C'est des élèves qui arrivent du secteur jeune ou de d'autres programmes qui ont eu un support supplémentaire pendant leur parcours au secondaire euh, et qui, là, au secondaire régulier, et qui, là, continuent leur formation, mais à leur rythme. Donc, voilà le contexte. Donc, imaginez le prof. Les élèves, ils ont tous besoin de quelque chose, ils sont tous très, euh, très motivés, mais parfois le prof peut, peut être un petit peu débordé. Ça me faisait rire avec le chien, je trouvais que c'était une belle image. Donc pour mettre en contexte, voilà la tâche euh, euh, que moi et Naomi euh, avons à deux profs. Est-ce que tu veux rajouter quelque chose, Naomi? Oui, bien on a commencé l'année justement en se disant « Mon Dieu Seigneur, comment on va y arriver? » Puis c'est ça qui nous a amené à euh, travailler en équipe, dans le fond, parce que ben, à deux, on fait moins de travail, puis on le fait moins en double. <rire> Donc, on s'est dit qu'on voulait collaborer. Donc, notre contexte présente des défis. On a proposé des solutions qu'on a appliquées euh, récemment ou même au début de l'année. Euh, à la euh, Commission scolaire sur le fait de Laurier, on travaille avec SOFAD. Je ne sais pas si c'est le cas pour toi, Priscilla, ou pour toi, euh, j'ai oublié ton nom, il faut que je vois sur la vidéo, <rire> l'autre oui. personne qui est avec nous. <rire> oui, j'utilise uh, SOFAD aussi. Excellent. Donc, SOFAD, c'est des livres. C'est très euh, académique, c'est du papier, on tourne les pages, puis on avance. Pour nous, pas, ça ne semblait pas très motivant pour les élèves. Donc, on a fait le choix de garder ce cahier-là comme du travail autonome. On va très peu aller corriger le travail de l'élève. On va juste le laisser, euh, pas s'habituer, mais s'occuper avec son cahier. Ce n'est pas la priorité, vraiment pas. Euh, ensuite, une autre solution qu'on a proposée, c'est de faire des capsules de grammaire, tout le monde ensemble, au début des Zooms. Et en même temps, avec les élèves en classe que les élèves sur Zoom, on a la chance euh, à l'école d'avoir ou un projecteur ou un tableau blanc. Donc, on peut projeter les actions qu'on fait sur l'ordinateur et les gens en classe le voient et les gens à la maison aussi. Donc, grammaire en grand groupe, euh, inévitable. C'est sûr que la grammaire, ce n'était pas pour les niveaux 1 à 5. Hein. Vous vous doutez bien que c'est un défi de de cibler des savoirs qui vont aider chaque niveau de secondaire 1 à 5. Euh, pour, dans mon cas, ce que je faisais, c'est que je prenais juste les secondaires 4 ou juste les secondaires 3. Euh, je n'ai pas encore trouvé de solution pour que tout le monde bénéficie euh, de la même notion. Ils ne sont pas au même niveau, ils n'ont pas les mêmes besoins non plus. Sur Zoom, on utilise beaucoup les breakout rooms, vraiment là, pour faire parler les élèves, pour les mettre en confiance, euh, pour aussi leur permettre de se concentrer. Quand on travaille dans une salle pleine, on voit des visages, on voit des vidéos, c'est distrayant. Tandis que dans les salles individuelles, c'est rien d'innovant, mais <rire> c'est une solution qu'on a adoptée. Euh, et finalement, la, le gros morceau, c'est le travail sur Microsoft Teams. Donc, nous, on est équipe Microsoft. Il y en a qui peuvent être équipe Google. Il y en a qui peuvent être équipe Edmodo. Le principe, en fait, c'est qu'on a créé des classes sur Teams pour chacun de nos niveaux et même pour chacun de nos livres. Donc, si vous êtes familier avec ce FAD, c'est euh, des niveaux euh, de, de, du secondaire, mais c'est des niveaux qui sont séparés en livres. Donc, pour secondaire 1, je crois qu'il y en a deux. Pour secondaire 2, il y en a un. Pour secondaire 3, il y a six livres. Secondaire 4, il y a quatre livres. Donc, ça fait beaucoup de, de, de choses à considérer. On a préféré le faire par livre. Comme on est en suivi individualisé, on peut avoir un élève qui est en secondaire 3 au début et l'autre qui est à la fin de son secondaire 4 et l'autre qui est au début de son secondaire 1. Donc, on voulait vraiment centraliser, rassembler, euh, le matériel pour aider nos élèves sur Teams. Mais, et aussi, oui, vas-y, 
je me rends compte, vous, vous avez rassemblé le matériel sur Teams, mais vous utilisez Zoom. Est-ce qu'il y a une raison? Oui, euh, en fait, c'est qu'on a commencé avec Zoom puis on n'a jamais pensé utiliser Teams comme réunion. Mais ce que je constate, peut-être, que, ben, en fait, ce que je pense, c'est que les élèves ont plus de facilité à avoir leur téléphone sur Zoom et accès à leur ordi pour euh, travailler sur Teams. Donc, ils ont comme deux écrans. C'est sûr que si l'élève n'a pas deux écrans, dans ce cas-là, il faut qu'il soit habile. Oh, vas-y, vas-y, Naomi. Je pense qu'il y a un délai, excuse-moi. Euh, c'est aussi qu'à l'école, tout le monde, tous les profs utilisent euh, Zoom pour euh, la, la visioconférence. Là, là. Visioconférence. Puis, euh, il, après ça, là, on choisit est-ce qu'on utilise euh, Google de... Mon Dieu, Seigneur, les mots me manquent. Classroom. Oh, euh, c'est ça. Fait que ça, c'est notre plateforme euh, pour les, les, les vidéos. Puis le reste, euh, ben, là, les profs choisissent. Oui. Euh, pour revenir à ce sujet-là, je pense que les élèves, si on faisait la réunion en visio sur Teams en même temps, ils auraient de la difficulté à naviguer dans leur cours, aller chercher leurs devoirs. Ça serait comme trop de gestion. On ne l'a pas essayé. Ça peut être une solution. Ça peut être une, une, un projet pour l'avenir, c'est sûr. Mais je pense qu'on a suivi juste la politique de l'école, tout simplement, sans se poser de questions. Euh, fait que les élèves reçoivent un, un lien Zoom et reçoivent leur accès à Teams et ils ont ces deux endroits-là pour, euh, pour nous retrouver, finalement. Dernière chose, récemment, on a eu la chance euh, que la direction accepte de rééquilibrer nos groupes. Alors, le fameux problème où on se retrouvait avec des niveaux 1 à 5, bien maintenant, c'est du passé. <rire> Donc, on a rajouté une enseignante qui a pris, elle, secondaire 3-4, Naomi a pris 4-5 et moi, j'ai pris secondaire 1-2. Dans chacun des groupes, les profs vont continuer le travail sur Teams aussi. Et que ça ne change pas. Ça allège un petit peu, on espère, <rire> le travail, euh, les tâches, euh, la charge de travail des profs. Et c'est aussi hein? dans le but d'aider les élèves, d'être plus présent, présente pour elles, pour eux. Je pense que je vais montrer Teams un peu pour que vous ayez comme un oui. idée de quoi on parle avant de montrer les, les sources, les, les, ce qu'on veut améliorer par la suite. Excellent. Um, ça va oui, puis est-ce que les filles, vous, avez, vous allez parler de, de ce que le fait d'utiliser Teams, parce que ça peut être Teams, ça peut être Moodle, ça peut être Google Classroom, là, je pense que c'est l'important, oui. c'est la plateforme, mais moi, ce que j'ai trouvé vraiment intéressant dans ce que vous faisiez, c'est que ça vous permet de ne pas toujours être en train de faire des petites tâches là, qui sont... Euh, « Ben oui, je vais aller chercher ton activité notée. Ah oui, tu as besoin d'un exercice sur telle affaire. » C'est ça. En complément de ça. C'est toutes ces petites minutes-là, les élèves deviennent beaucoup plus autonomes en utilisant la plateforme. Le but, c'est de exactement. les prendre autonomes à 100%, exactement. Qu'on qu n'ait ouais. pas à utiliser qu'ils puissent commencer à travailler. Je viens de voir quand j'ai deux minutes, c'est parce que c'est beaucoup ça, la formation pour adultes. Euh, OK, je partage Teams, mais c'est ça. On, 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 vous, on vous partage ce qu'on a fait sur Teams, mais c'est sûr que c'est possible de le faire sur d'autres plateformes aussi. Euh, ayez pas peur. <rire> euh, Annie-Claude a géré ça comme une chef. Elle a euh, mis des codes <rire> couleurs. Ça nous sauve la vie. Euh, donc, <rire> j'ai pas accès au secondaire 1-2. Donc, on commence avec les trois. Donc, ça va parler. De 3101 à euh, 5106, tout est là. Euh, donc, après ça, on a classé chaque élève, dépendamment de quel livre était rendu, dans la, la bonne équipe qu'on appelle. Eux, ils ont accès à... Euh, ça ressemble beaucoup à Facebook. Tu sais, c'est à ça je, que je le compare quand je parle à mes élèves puis que je leur présente la plateforme. C'est que c'est... J'utilise un anglicisme. C'est comme un feed Facebook. Donc, les choses les plus anciennes sont en haut quand on monte, puis ça va jusqu'aux choses les plus récentes. Euh, les élèves commencent par... Quand ils s'inscrivent, ils commencent par aller en haut puis, euh, clique sur le premier devoir, les exercices sur les homophones, affiche le premier devoir. Là, je vais cliquer sur Student View, que vous puissiez voir ce qu'ils voient. Donc, c'est pas, un, pas un, bon, <rire> un bon exemple. D'habitude, il y a des instructions, okay, ici, où là, on écrit, bon, euh, regarde euh, la vidéo euh, sur YouTube, il y a, clique sur le lien, après ça, fais le questionnaire sur Forms. C'est plus, plus complexe, ça. J'ai choisi le pire, le pire de voir, je pense. C'est nos débuts. 
C'était oui, nos débuts. Ça. On, on s'est amélioré <rire> avec le temps, vraiment. Puis, on n'a pas fini, c'est clair. Euh, nous, ce qu'on voit en tant que prof, euh, c'est super le fun. Ça rassemble vraiment tout. Euh, on voit qui a fait les devoirs. Donc là, on, les noms remis, on voit. Ils disent, mais non, mais moi, je l'ai fait. Non, tu ne l'as pas fait. On peut le voir ici. Euh, on voit si les gens l'ont remis en retard. On voit s'ils l'ont seulement consulté, mais qu'ils ne l'ont pas remis, euh, etc. Là, il euh, y a aussi une fonction où on peut renvoyer les devoirs, donc euh, corriger ce que l'élève a fait, puis lui renvoyer avec des commentaires. Donc, euh, c'est super. On n'a pas, euh, pas à avoir une liste à côté en train de cocher qui l'a fait, qui me l'a remis, qui me l'a pas remis, puis gérer. Encore une fois, ça s'en charge pour nous. Euh, ça, c'est pour chaque devoir. La, la fonction de voir qui l'a fait. Oups, excusez-moi, je retourne là-dedans. On peut, euh, dans Teams, en haut ici, voir note. Là, encore une fois, je ne sais pas ça, c'est si c'est merveilleux. <rire> Euh, mais ça nous sauve la vie. C'est, euh, dans le fond, tous les élèves qui sont dans notre groupe. Puis ensuite, on a euh, tous les devoirs qu'on a attribués, puis le statut euh, des devoirs. Puis on peut aussi consulter directement le travail de l'élève à partir de la grille euh, de notes. Moi, moi, je, le mot que j'utilise, c'est magique. Là. <rire> c'est vraiment le fun. Euh, c'est ça. Donc, là, comme vous avez vu, c'est un peu pile mail euh, dans notre feed euh, Teams, OK? Une amélioration qu'on veut euh, faire, sur laquelle on veut travailler prochainement, c'est euh, de faire des sous-canaux. Donc, euh, là, le canal général, c'est comme ce qu'on vient de voir. Il y a possibilité d'ajouter des canaux pour euh, classer nos, nos devoirs en fonction de grammaire, lecture, écoute, orale. Ça, c'est un projet, mais euh, c'est ça. <rire> projet. Projet. Est-ce que j'oublie quelque chose, Annie-Claude? Euh, ben, dans les améliorations, peut-être que tu, tu voulais me montrer un exemple de grille d'évaluation, mais euh, on peut aller voir euh, les améliorations, oui. OK. Je peux monter, montrer l'exemple de grille d'évaluation. Je pense que j'ai travaillé là-dessus aujourd'hui, sinon tu m'aurais pris au dépourvu. <rire> non, non, mais tu en avais une dans la classe test. <rire> ah oui. Oui. <rire> Euh, canal, ici, j'en ai fait un euh, écriture. Il clique sur View Assignment. Juste pour ne pas vous effrayer, ces fonctions-là sont aussi disponibles dans Google Classroom, là, même qui sont plus avancées. Il y a comme une compétition entre les deux plateformes. Toutes les possibilités sont présentes dans les deux applications ou les deux classes virtuelles, si vous voulez. Les grilles de correction, les commentaires, le renvoi, le suivi. Il faut juste choisir sa famille. <rire> Donc, euh, ici, c'est un peu plus complet. J'ai moins honte. Euh, on a les instructions. <rire> Qu'est-ce que les élèves ont à faire? Puis, euh, on peut ajouter des grilles de correction directement euh, sur Teams. Dans le fond, je lis le texte de l'élève. Puis après, je viens cocher euh, comme si tu sais, j'étais sur papier puis j'entourais. Puis, ça nous donne une note euh, sur 100. Ça se pondère automatiquement. C'est magique. <rire> C'est bon. Donc, euh, là, on n'a pas fait ça pour tous nos, nos devoirs. Oh non! <rire> euh, encore une fois, le temps va, va faire son œuvre. Je pense que c'est ça, ça résume. En fait, on, on reconnaît que notre produit ou notre, nos idées ne sont pas parfaites, loin de là. Euh, ce qu'on propose comme amélioration, c'est les suivantes. Et si vous en avez d'autres vous pouvez nous les partager. Euh, donc, les fameuses grilles d'évaluation intégrées au devoir. Et puis, euh, au départ, moi, je pensais créer des grilles. Il en existe déjà. L'idée, c'est juste de les transférer en digital, donc de les retaper dans la section des grilles. Euh, ensuite, dans nos devoirs, c'est un peu mélangé. Là. Ça, va, ça marche par date, mais pas par thème ou par savoir ou par compétence. On aimerait travailler là-dessus. Et finalement, euh, l'amélioration, la plus grande amélioration, c'est qu'on a un troisième prof. Au départ, on était deux à gérer l'individualisé au secondaire en FLS. Là, on est trois. Donc, ça va nous laisser un petit peu de, d'espace pour créer, pour arranger des choses. Puis Donc, avec euh, la voilà. plateforme, c'est super euh, facile parce que, dans le fond, il a fallu se séparer les élèves, mais les élèves ne l'ont pas ressenti tant que ça, à part le lien Zoom qui a changé. Euh, c'est vrai. Pour, pour le lien Zoom de notre, notre collègue, mais ils sont restés dans le même groupe. Euh, ils ont gardé leur, euh, leur, leur, leur suivi. Sentiment, 
Ouais. Ils n'ont pas besoin de se répéter. Puis la prof, c'est super facile d'aller voir, bon, ben c'est un nouvel élève, mais dans le fond, je sais tout ce qu'il a fait. Euh, puis j'ai des marques là, de, de des, traces. des traces. Ouais. <rire> euh, des applications qu'on utilise dans les devoirs sur Teams. Donc, un devoir, c'est que c'est un, un document vierge dans lequel on ajoute des liens, des consignes. Euh, puis, c'est ça, c'est une partie des applications. Bien sûr, on est encore en train d'en découvrir plein. Là. Il en sort tous les jours, toutes les semaines pour, pour euh, nous aider. Mais c'est les principales. Euh, Flipgrid, dans la, le suivi pour la COPO, donc pour faire parler nos élèves, euh, pas pendant le cours, mais après. Donc, ce qu'on dit là, asynchrone, je pense. Euh, en gros, tu t'enregistres à l'oral devant eux. Par exemple, okay, parle-moi de tes passions. Tu fais un exemple. Ma passion, c'est et parce que. Et là, tu dis, toi, fais la même chose. Là, ils s'enregistrent. C'est vraiment simple. C'est un gros plus vert. Ils appuient, ils s'enregistrent, ils envoient. Puis, ils peuvent se répondre entre élèves comme ça. Donc, ça permet de, de continuer de pratiquer l'oral, même quand on n'est pas en train de le superviser comme enseignant. Parce que comme vous avez vu et comme vous le savez sûrement, on est pris à droite, à gauche à essayer d'aider euh, nos élèves le plus possible. Ensuite, Ed Puzzle, si vous ne connaissez pas Ed Puzzle, <rire> il faut le connaître. On prend une vidéo déjà construite sur YouTube ou qu'on a fait nous-mêmes et on y ajoute, on y intègre directement des questions. Donc, il n'est plus question d'aller ouvrir un lien, écouter une vidéo, ouvrir un autre document. C'est tout intégré. Pour nos élèves qui ont plus de difficultés avec la technologie ou plus de défis, je devrais dire, euh, c'est vraiment utile. Euh, Forms, bien sûr, là, comme Google euh, Forms aussi, Microsoft Forms fait la même chose. Rétroaction instantanée, Quizlet, des quiz pour le vocabulaire, super. Word Wall, merveilleux. Je vous les nomme vite, vite, c'est du name dropping, mais je vous invite à aller les visiter, à aller voir euh, comment c'est organisé. C'est super ludique. Ça s'appelait à tous les niveaux, je vous le garantis. Euh, learning apps, dans le même principe, des jeux de mémoire, des associations pour euh, vérifier euh, la compréhension des élèves. Et puis, en P, C, E, compréhension écrite, production écrite, des forms, bien sûr, hein, classique. Et puis, j'ai trouvé une application avec la grenouille qui s'appelle Conjuguemos pour les élèves en immersion. Euh, ça permet de travailler en français et en anglais en même temps. Si vous avez des élèves qui ont vraiment besoin de lier leur connaissance à ce qu'ils ont en anglais, ça peut être vraiment utile. Si vous voulez que je vous en parle plus longuement, ça va me faire plaisir. J'utilise ça, entre autres, avec euh, des élèves qui ont un petit, un petit retard dans leur niveau, là, qui prennent un peu plus de temps pour, euh, pour, pour compléter leur formation. C'est tout. C'est pas mal ça. <rire> Parle, parle, jase, jase. <rire> sûrement deux choses à dire, d'autres choses à dire, je ne sais pas. Naomi, Alex? Non, moi, je voulais juste dire que, tu sais, justement, si je, je vous avais nommé là, pour euh, présenter, c'est parce que je trouvais que c'était super intéressant ce que vous faisiez, parce que ça permet réellement d'avoir plus de temps, finalement, pour vraiment, vraiment aider l'élève, que ce ne soit pas du temps d'espèce de, 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 de comme, transition vers « je te donne ci euh, » ou, tu sais, l'élève est autonome, organisé, il sait où est-ce qu'il s'en va, mais quand il a besoin de votre aide, vous êtes beaucoup plus disponible. Je pense que c'est ça, la, pour moi, la clé du succès de ce Teams-là là, ou de cette, cette plateforme. Oui, c'est vraiment l'objectif. Mais c'est ça. Nous, on est curieuse, nous, d'entendre ce, ce que vous avez euh, comme bon coup dans vos, vos écoles, vos commissions scolaires qui pourraient nous échapper, qui pourraient nous aider. Mon Dieu Seigneur, dans ce temps... Euh, de pandémie, tout, tout est bienvenu. Félicitations, parce que je, je, je vois qu'il y a beaucoup d'ouvrages derrière tout ça hein, pour euh, euh, monter, euh, je, je sais que c'est long, <rire> monter ces plateformes. Moi, moi, je travaille avec Moodle, mais euh, nos enseignants en FGA, chez nous, travaillent avec Teams. Ah. Euh, voilà. Alors, eux aussi, euh, en, français, en, en français langue seconde, dans toutes les matières, c'est avec Teams. Donc, ils ont monté leur matériel sur Teams. Et euh, ben, certaines euh, applications que vous avez notées, euh, euh, ils les utilisent aussi. Bon, entre autres, euh, vous n'avez pas parlé de Padlet, là, mais chez eux autres, ils en ont, ils utilisent ça. Non! Oui, c'est vrai, je n'ai pas, pas insisté sur Padlet parce qu'on euh, n'avait pas la licence école pour celui-là. Fait que j'ai pu l'utiliser au début de l'année, puis après j'ai dû me retourner vers une autre application qui s'appelle Trello, 
si jamais le problème survient, Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O, ça prend un compte Google, par contre. Fait que là, c'est une aventure, mais euh, ça, ça fait le même a... travail. <rire> pour ça qu'on a décidé de choisir euh, Microsoft Teams au lieu de Google, parce que euh, au début de l'année, là, nous, on a mis un, un point d'honneur. J'ai de la misère avec ces expressions-là. Euh, on s'est dit, on va utiliser euh, le courriel de l'école parce que quand la pandémie a éclaté, puis que là, tout le monde est parti chez eux, puis il a fallu euh, comme euh, mon Dieu, contacter nos étudiants. Um, ça a été super compliqué. Puis là, les adresses courriel, mon Dieu, Seigneur, euh, IT Car 1979, puis là, ça m'écrivait, pas de signature. Je me disais, mon Dieu, mais t'es qui? Donc, quand septembre a commencé, on s'est dit, non, 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 là, tous ceux qui entrent dans le centre ont leur adresse um, de la commission scolaire. Puis, euh, ben là, ils ont deux choix. Les profs qui ont décidé d'utiliser um, Google Classroom, euh, Google Drive et tout, ils utilisent plus l'adresse courriel euh, swlsb.ca, donc l'adresse Google, de courriel. Puis, ceux qui ont utilisé, euh, ceux qui utilisent Microsoft Teams et tout, utilisent euh, ben, Outlook, euh, l'adresse de, de Microsoft. C'est pour ça qu'on s'est dit, nos élèves sont assez mélangés. Là. Il faut vraiment euh, simplifier le tout pour eux. Si on dit c'est Microsoft, puis une adresse courriel, c'est déjà assez dur à <rire> avec le courriel et tout. Puis, euh, dans le fond, à partir de leur courriel, là, ils peuvent accéder à Teams, ils peuvent accéder à Forms, à OneDrive. On essaie vraiment de concentrer nos efforts puis euh, les ressources au même endroit pour que ce soit plus facile. On s'entend qu'ils ont de la misère à se retrouver puis nous autres aussi, là, de dire, euh, oui, mais va sur ce site web-là. Puis là, si tu veux utiliser cette application-là, il faut que tu ailles ton adresse Google. Et là, là. Donc, c'est pour ça qu'on avait choisi de, de, de rassembler tout au même endroit. Et vous, Priscilla et Matache, <rire> dans vos classes, dans vos écoles, est-ce qu'il se passe quelque chose? Alors, dans, dans ma classe, moi, j'en ai un niveau de 1 à 5, au français, de langue seconde, oui. Mais euh, on a aussi Google Classroom et chacun profite de Classroom selon son niveau. Et comme ça, on fait les échanges et il y a l'enseignante à tout moment pour tous les élèves, c'est-à-dire que, par exemple, le premier groupe, alors je vais avec eux, après c'est le deuxième groupe, après le troisième groupe, en tant que bon, quelque chose, c'est l'autre groupe qui vient, et comme ça, je m'en occupe, mais plutôt ce sont des groupes qui sont plus rapprochés, c'est-à-dire niveau 1 et 2 qui vont travailler ensemble. Comme vous, vous l'avez dit, je crois que c'était trois et quatre ensemble et il y a seulement cinq niveaux alors quatre et cinq ou bien parfois trois quatre cinq ensemble alors c'est comme ça que ça roule bon c'est trop difficile de gérer cinq niveaux mais il faut faire avec c'est la, la question de pandémie alors les étudiants on est on a des adultes nous. alors c'est difficile Voyez-vous, de, de les motiver. Et en plus, lorsque les enfants sont à la maison, il faut les aider à faire leurs devoirs. C'est assez difficile de tenir les adultes devant leur ordinateur. Et après, en plus, qu'il faut partager. Il n'y a pas 40 ordinateurs à la maison. Et normalement, on a beaucoup d'enfants. Alors, c'est pour ça que ce n'est pas facile non plus. C'est c'est... Bien que les micros sont fermés, mais quand même, comme on est chez nous, il y a toujours les bruits des enfants, c'est tumultueux lorsque vous posez une question à quelqu'un. Il y a des difficultés, mais quand même, c'est bon. Mais c'est classe-fou, mais c'est facile. Mais j'ai bien aimé Team, c'est parce que j'ai fait aussi une formation avec Rexy pour la lecture. Et il y avait les, des coupes syllabiques. Alors, mmh. j'ai adoré ça. C'est parce que vraiment, ça, ça aide à l'intonation, à couper les lames. Mais le problème, c'est qu'il faut taper les textes. C'est-à-dire, lorsqu'on télécharge un texte en PDF, on n'arrive pas. Il faut que ça soit sur Word. Non, je ne savais même pas que... Je, on ne pourra pas être en dessous-là. Comment? Que... Oui, pardon. Je voulais juste dire, ça, c'est une des difficultés avec le fait de passer de, de la classe régulière à euh, une plateforme. Mmh. C'est sûr que mmh. c'est long, tout nos, nos, notre matériel est, est en version papier. 
Mais je pense qu'il faut le voir un document à la fois, puis euh, vraiment y aller euh, une étape à la fois, puis de ne pas s'attendre à un produit fini. Tu sais, comme les filles vous dites, c'est un produit qui est en continu, puis on, on y va une chose à la fois, parce que je sais que vous avez beaucoup de matériel qui a été bâti au fil du temps, que ce soit par vous ou les autres enseignantes avant, mais c'est du matériel en classe. Sauf que là, ce que vous, vous avez, moi, que je trouve qui est très intéressant, puis j'imagine ma tâche, c'est la même chose avec vous si vous avez Google Classroom, c'est que s'il y a un nouvel enseignant qui arrive demain et que vous voulez partager quelque chose avec cet enseignant-là, c'est extrêmement facile de partager euh, ça aussi. Là. Puis justement, aujourd'hui, euh, puis toutes les autres fois où on va avoir des après-cours, s'il y a d'autres personnes en français langue seconde, il peut avoir beaucoup d'échanges de matériel facilement euh, virtuel. Justement, je l'ai bâti moi-même et même lorsque je donne des cours aux primaires, c'est-à-dire avant je faisais ça, et alors c'était tout le monde était volontaire d'avoir ma, ma classe c'est parce que c'était tellement complet et tellement d'images, de, de cours scannés par moi-même. Alors, vraiment, c'est très intéressant, sans, sans vouloir m'envoyer des fleurs. Mais non, on est là pour ça. <rire> eh oui. <rire> tellement de travail, tout monter ça, là, que... Ouais. Ça fait plusieurs années, hein, mais je l'ai bâti toute seule. Mais c'est une vraie bibliothèque. Et vidéothèque, un audiothèque. <rire> tout à la fois. <rire> C'est bien parce que tout est regroupé au même endroit. C'est ça qui devient intéressant oui. là, avec, avec la plateforme. C'est presque votre bibliothèque, même plus, que oui. vous avez derrière vous. Ah. Oui. <rire> C'était quelque chose aussi qu'on n'avait pas quand l'école a fermé le, le 13 mars dernier. J'imagine que la plupart des enseignants se sont retrouvés chez eux avec un ordinateur portable puis pas tout leur matériel qu'ils avaient habituellement. Fait que là, au moins... S'il y a une fermeture de classe, s'il y a une fermeture d'école, vous avez tout ce, que, tout ce dont vous avez besoin, c'est là, c'est dans votre Teams ou dans votre Google Classroom, donc c'est intéressant. Aussi. Oui, justement, c'était ça. Lorsqu'on nous a demandé d'aller au centre pour chercher nos affaires, je leur ai dit, je n'ai pas besoin, j'ai tout sur moi. Alors, j'en veux pas, merci. Je suis restée <rire> chez moi. C'est bien. J'ai une question <rire> toutefois par rapport à... à L'enseignement des euh, euh, par situation d'apprentissage. Comment vous, vous arrivez à faire euh, l'enseignement par situation d'apprentissage? Parce que ce que j'ai vu, c'était bon des devoirs qui sont liés plus à des, à des activités grammaticales, mais euh, les programmes d'études qu'on enseigne sont beaucoup euh, nous amènent à, à enseigner avec les situation d'apprentissage. Alors, comment vous réussissez là, à, à utiliser la situation d'apprentissage? Écoutez, déjà, actuellement, j'utilise les sophates que j'ai entendu, il n'y avait pas beaucoup de prenants pour. Mais je trouve les sophates, c'est parce qu'il y a maintenant, je travaille avec les adultes, la francisation. Alors, c'est très, très bien fait. Le livre niveau 1, 2 et 5 sont sortis et sont faits à partir des situations d'apprentissage. Et les, comme d'habitude que je le faisais avant, la grammaire est incluse dedans. Alors, c'est pour ça qu'il n'y a pas de séparation. Et lorsque vous parlez, vous donnez le cours. Ensuite, vous pouvez joindre la grammaire qui vient avec. Et tout ça, c'est en un seul coup. Ce n'est pas des pièces séparées qu'on veut les mettre ensemble. Pour notre part, je pense que c'est euh, un travail qu'on qu qu continue de bâtir. Euh, mm. Le livre, c'est vrai qu'il est bâti en situation d'apprentissage, euh, mais on a trouvé que, euh, je ne sais pas, là je parle pour moi, je dis « on », mais… <rire> je, parle, je parle aussi. <rire> oui, OK. On a trouvé que euh, les élèves étaient un peu mélangés quand on a le temps de lire le livre parce qu'ils sont la plupart du temps tout seuls, puis ben, là, ils ont des questions, mais ce n'est pas clair. Fait on a commencé par la grammaire, oui. On a commencé par des activités euh, tout seul, d'oral, des. Puis là, tu sais, ça, c'est tout le temps en deuxième partie du cours, en tout cas pour ma part. En pre... Tu sais, on a des périodes de deux heures. Euh, moi, la première heure, je fais souvent, euh, ben, on... on fait une activité de groupe, tout le monde ensemble. Puis euh, c'est là, tu sais, qu'on va plus. Euh... 
je vais plus travailler par situation, tu sais, on fait une activité ensemble, puis après ça, bien, aller travailler la grammaire, puis tu sais, dépendamment des élèves, euh, on le sait, euh, on est capable de voir, bien, ce qu'ils ont à travailler et tout, là, mais c'est, dans le meilleur des mondes, on va travailler plus en situation d'apprentissage, je pense qu'on a besoin de rassembler tous les morceaux du casse-tête, puis euh, pour faire un tout, parce que c'est vrai que là, c'est vraiment euh, au compte goutte là, mais le temps nous... J'imagine que c'était selon les besoins, parce que, tu sais, comme ben, vous en parlez aussi, euh, ma tâche, mais dans le guide SOFAD, c'est pas complet. Si on suit qu'au guide, qu guide SOFAD, il euh, y a cinq questions sur un point de grammaire, par exemple, tu sais, A à E, là, on n'ira pas loin si l'élève a des difficultés avec euh, une structure, là, tu sais, par exemple. Tout euh, pas expliqué, tu sais. Ouais, une... Ici, plus présent, futur, oui. il y a juste trois questions, puis qu'il n'y a pas d'explication, il n'y a rien. Euh, effectivement, euh, je pense qu'il y a, y a, y a l'aspect que, disons, que ce soit sur le Teams, puis qu'il y ait, y ait des, peut-être des petites capsules avec d'autres exercices supplémentaires. Puis moi, si je peux me permettre, quand j'enseignais ce cours-là au départ, ben nous, on avait fait des cahiers d'exercices supplémentaires, parce que dans oui. le fond, je trouvais que ce n'était pas suffisant. Mais ce que je trouve super intéressant, c'est que là, c'est dynamique, c'est interactif, et qu'au lieu que ce soit des cahiers, ben là, c'est dans un Teams... Euh, euh, mais effectivement, je pense que de, de laisser ce faire totalement, il faudrait alors essayer d'aller, euh, de construire les plateformes de manière pour que ça fonctionne avec euh, le programme d'études, effectivement. Et là, je pense que tu as raison. Là. Mais c'est fait selon le programme d'études, les SOFAD actuels pour la francisation, oui. Je le trouvais intéressant. Moi, j'ai travaillé sur, euh, sur, les, sur les livres SOFAD. Je ne peux pas être content. <rire> Mais il y a longtemps. Euh, non, il y a cinq. Oui, ces livres-là, non, les livres, de, les livres niveau 1, niveau 2, euh, niveau 5 là, qui sont sortis. Ah oui, ah, le, le niveau langue seconde? Euh, non, français langue seconde, non, j'ai juste fait. Moi, j'ai travaillé. <rire> fait que toi, c'est français langue seconde. Tu vois, on ne peut pas trop chialer sur ce qui se fait, hein, des fois. Mais ça ne veut pas dire que parce qu'on a travaillé dessus, tu sais, je veux dire, on se fait aussi donner euh, des, des directives des structures. Je n'étais pas d'accord avec tout ce que j'ai fait non plus, là, mais tu sais, on... Puis, ben moi, j'ai travaillé plus tro euh, 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 le troisième niveau, parce que le 1, 2, euh, niveau 1, pas 1, en termes de... Hey, le 3, je pense, ça t'a. Les premiers qui ont été créés, là, en tout cas, là, ils sont tellement épais, ça n'a pas de bon Ah oui, oui, oui. 11-03, 11-04, là, c'est pour le secondaire. Et après, le temps est tellement limité, tellement peu, qu'on ne peut même pas rentrer dans les détails. Ben, non, c'est là, vraiment, c'est les livres de secondaire, j'en parle pas. Je non, parle non, sur les fait. livres, les, les actuelles francisations. Oui, Sinon, ça, il y avait le livre de secondaire 4 et 5. Oh mon Dieu, c'était pour français langue seconde. C'était tellement dur, tellement dur, tellement dur que moi, je trouvais comment enseigner ça. Ben, effectivement, que les livres euh, et puis le programme en, en lui-même a été construit, à, il a été bâti, créé à des moments différents. Là, parce que ça, c'est son R1-2, puis après son R3-4-5. Puis moi aussi, je trouve ça difficile. On en a parlé avec Annie-Claude. Les livres de secondaire 1 et 2, c'est des briques. C'est traduit. C'est décourageant mmh. pour les élèves. C'est décourageant. C'est trop. Alors, euh, nos enseignants ont, ont passé au travers et ont choisi des situations d'apprentissage qui permettaient de rejoindre les objectifs du programme d'études. Alors, euh, ils Mais ne font plus. Ils encore, Hélène. Ils Pardon? Ils utilisent encore ces cahiers-là. Mais ils ont comme élagué un peu, c'est ça? Ah, beaucoup. Ils ont élagué parce que c'était beaucoup trop laborieux pour... Euh... Mais au moment où ils ont été élaborés, il fallait répondre à certains critères. <rire> Et vous, si vous vous souvenez comment les programmes ont été bâtis, ben on les bâtissait quasiment en même temps qu'on les enseignait. Puis là, en même temps, il fallait construire le matériel. Alors, c'était... Euh... Il y a quelqu'un de votre commission scolaire euh, qui a travaillé sur euh, l'élaboration des programmes aussi. Là. Chez, ben, chez nous aussi, la même chose, mais je ne sais pas pourquoi. C'est parce que déjà, le secondaire 4 était beaucoup plus difficile que le secondaire 5. Et ça, c'était étonnant. Je ne sais pas si vous l'avez remarqué ou non, mais c'était étonnant que le secondaire 4 était plus difficile. 
Oui, puis ça, Naomi, avais, toi aussi, tu trouvais qu'il y avait certains aspects là, du cahier de secondaire 4 euh, dans la sexe, dans le, le, tu sais, c'est le 41-0... Euh, 41-0-3, les, les lettres de plainte et tout, et là, là, c est, c est, je trouve que la barre est haute comparée à, si on arrive en secondaire 5, puis là, il faut écrire un texte narratif ou comme mm -hmm. parler de, de l'emploi. Je comme, me semble que le niveau est, tu sais, oui, on s'attend à... à quelque chose de plus élaboré, mais la, la structure, en tout cas. Bon, mais merci beaucoup à vous. Merci vous. à vous. Merci, merci beaucoup. Merci, c'était un bel échange. Euh, oui. Allez, tout le monde. Oui. Alors, à la prochaine. À la prochaine. All right. Um, welcome. Welcome to this session, SISVI, co-hosted by uh, me and Jen Campbell. Um, I think most of you know me, right? <laughs> Matthew of Lester B, consultant in inclusive education. Um, and then we've got Jen. Jen, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I don't recognize a lot of faces. I'm sure I've met quite a few of you before. I'm uh, the counterpart of Matthew. I'm the special ed consultant for the adult sector of the English Montreal School Board. Nice to meet you all. Face. Um, so yeah, this is kind of like in absence of being able to do like, uh, you, you know, our usual projects and our SI network stuff, right? We were meeting more regularly, collaborating with other centers. So today we can kind of like, you know, uh, keep that alive a little bit in like the COVID world, right? Um, so the, the general discussion prompt, and we'll return to this once um, Steph and Kira have shared what they're going to share is what are you do doing in your classroom that's working well? And, um, and what do you want to share with teachers in your subject area? Okay, so Kira and Stephanie will um, share then you can answer that first part of the question. I want to hear from everyone in terms of what's going well. And then the sharing piece is you can do that verbally, but also claim a slide for that. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, so Kira, Steph, who would like to go first? Okay, Kira, Kira's pointing to herself. So I'm gonna- Yeah, is that okay, Stephanie? Thank you. Um, so I don't so much have a resource to share per se as to share a story about a resource that uh, I think most of us are probably already using. Okay, so best practices. It's we are an SIS classroom with hearing and deaf students and staff. So in our class, uh, we are 13 hearing individuals and two deaf individuals. I am hearing and I have never taught a culturally deaf student before in my career. And this year we have a deaf student and she communicates in ASL almost exclusively. Uh, she comes to us with two staff. She has an attendant who is also deaf. So, anyway, so the student, she came to us. Um, we thought that she would be coming with the hearing interpreter and that the interpreter would sort of be her attendant over the course of the day. And that would be that. But it turned out that having a hearing interpreter full-time was just not really feasible for a number of reasons. Um, so instead, she came with a deaf attendant and an interpreter part-time. So because the hearing interpreter is not available full-time, often the work of doing the interpretation falls to the deaf attendant. Um, so she is really an amazing individual and she has the ability to lip read English and she also reads and writes English text. Because of her skills in this area, we are able to make use of technology to provide real-time language interpretation. And the thing that I think most of us here use is Google Meet and it's spe speech-to-text real-time transcription. There it is. So, Google Meet uh, provides captions as I am speaking. I teach using a microphone and as I speak, the captions are instantly provided. In this way, we're able to have a group discussion. What that previously would have been impossible to follow for a deaf person, even with a hearing interpreter, it um, is just very bewildering to follow because there are no auditory cues to know who to look at. But with the captioning, the deaf attendant is able to follow the conversation and then translate to ASL for the student. So in this way, I become sort of like a, I mean, an animator to the discussion 
but it means that I also need to watch how I am speaking. So as we work through a group discussion, I have learned how to speak so Google Meet makes fewer errors. Uh, one thing I do is I take a lot of pauses as I speak. This lets the algorithm catch up, but it has also proven helpful for maintaining calmer energy in a very enthusiastic class. I have also learned to speak more concisely. Um, as the students are speaking, because they are far away from the microphone, uh, it cannot pick up what they're saying. So I end up repeating what they are saying, usually summarizing it as well, in order to let the attendant know who has spoken so she can interpret for the student, including the name of the person who has spoken. At first, it was a big pain, uh, mostly because the Bluetooth microphone would keep disconnecting. And because at first we had too many computers in the classroom that were connected to the um, to the Google Meet. So we were in the classroom and the deaf attendant had uh, her laptop connected to the Google Meet. The student across the room from her facing her had her computer connected to the Google Meet. I at the front of the classroom did also and Liz at the back of the classroom did too. So we had four devices and sometimes also the smart board. So there were five audio video devices in the same classroom. And so we were just getting tons of audio feedback. Um, and because we would sometimes also have an ASL interpreter connected, she would be not in the room with us, but connected via the Google Meet. So there was just a need for us to be able to hear. So we had to figure out which speakers to turn on and which microphones to mute. And it was just, very difficult and painful first few months but we figured it out and we just scaled back the number of devices to the bare minimum so i had a device the student and the attendant and that was it and everybody except for me was muted we got rid of the bluetooth technology in favor of corded earbuds which has really just been so much simpler and uh, these days we just cruise along um, using written English and ASL and honestly it's been so great. My only wish would be for Google Meet to allow you to pin more than one person to a screen and to be able to choose like when screen sharing happens often people will get bumped off and sometimes that will be the interpreter will no longer be able to see the student um, so that is a big pain in the neck. Uh, anyway, so now that I can see your faces, I feel much better. <laughs> that was very bewildering. Um, yeah, so Google Meet has really, like, I would not be able to teach this student in this way without this technology. So it's been uh, just a really cool experience. Liz, did I miss anything important? No, I think you did great, Kara. Yeah, it's... Uh... I agree with everything you said. I agree with Kira. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a really cool experience, right? But also super stressful. Like Liz and mm -hmm. Kira have had to do a lot of like heavy lifting to make sure the tech is working. And this, this concept, right, of, or just the reality of communicating with the student in class who has a deaf attendant and communicating with an interpreter online, right? Like it's, there's a lot involved in it. And it's it, like, to me, there's like, you know, the UDL part of me is like, great is like, this is very cool because um, it is having an impact on the other students in, in positive ways, but it's also like, it's also showing you how environments and how our society is just not super accessible naturally. You know what I mean? So it's kind of showing and even technology where the limitations come in, like Kira and Liz have to repeat a question a student said so that this student can have it, you know, relate to them through like satellites to someone, you know, an interpreter mm. to the, you know what I mean? So it's very cool, but it's also like, ah, uh, you know? Yeah, it also forces the other students to be patient and to wait their turn. Like the, you can't all talk at the same time because we have to wait for the interpreter and there's a delay uh, to be able to hear that deaf student. So it, it really, it, it really, I think is beneficial to them as well. Yep. Yeah. 
And, and like, so let's say you don't have a deaf student in your class or you don't have a reason to have to do this. Like for me, the takeaway is like, Kira's learned, right? Um, to speak more slowly, right? And it, <laughs> Yay, <laughs> happened, deal. Pardon me? Which is a big deal. <laughs> yeah, and it's, yeah. it's benefiting all the students. Like the vibe in the class, in a class that's like high anxiety is way more chill because of this. So to me, like there's something, you know, very, very cool about that, you know? Um, any, any comments or questions for, for Kira and, and Liz about this particular, um, you know, uh, uh, teaching context? I have a question about if other students were learning sign at the same time, are you teaching them as well about using sign? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it is, Basically, we're just sort of like a communication first and however you communicate works. So at the beginning of the year, we sort of did a slideshow because a lot of the students have fine motor issues and they were getting very distressed because they would be able to understand the signs but not be able to, to make them. So uh, we did a lot of like, how can we communicate in this class? So we everybody has like markers for whiteboards. And we talked about, um, you know, typically with a deaf person, you can, if you want to get someone's attention, you can tap them on the shoulder. With COVID, we couldn't do that. So we talked about how are some other ways to get um, communication. So yes, definitely we're all doing ASL. Um, I at first asked the student if she wanted to teach ASL, but she doesn't. So it gets a little awkward because I'm not deaf and I'm teaching ASL, but I don't really use it. So that's, I just want to be careful of how I'm doing that, you know? But um, there are also some really great videos out there. So like for our, our holiday concert, we um, did like a song to ASL. And that was actually, that was actually a really good, like repeated thing. Um, we use phrases. We have an ASL club that I've invited some of the other students in some of the other classes. And they're very interested. And so we're doing that on a weekly basis as a trial run for a month. And that's been actually really fun. Like today I ran into one of the students from another class and she was like, oh, I had really fun. It was a little awkward because her mother was there too. And uh, that was, a, we were a little shy, but um, it's been, it's been cool because it's also um, made the hearing students. Like, I think we don't realize how much we are attuned to sound. And so at first when we started watching ASL videos that are run by a deaf man, there's no speech in his videos. So I had to say, you need to look at him like he's speaking, you know? And so it took a while for us to really learn how to orient towards him. Anyway, I'm rambling on now, but yeah, we, we do. We really, I try and conceptualize our classes one in which we use two languages. Julie? Yeah, I want to tell you that's it's amazing what you're doing. Um, I wanted to know also how is it working for you in the classroom with lip reading wearing a mask? Because for us, that was a huge part for years. We're teaching our students how to read expressions and our faces um, just for emotion. And then all of a sudden we're wearing a mask. And for us, we got the clear mask so that they could read our lips. But we only were allowed 10 because a box of 10 was like a hundred dollars. So now we're like using it sparingly when there's like somebody having a fit and we need to show them we're real mad or something. We switch on to that one. But those the, the, you. Well, we, um, we were using blue ones. So we got used to just like stepping away from someone and pulling the mask down. Yeah. Um, at first uh, I would use the shield. And when I was teaching in front of the class, like we, we also had to figure out how to arrange our classroom because a, we needed to have a two meter bubble. So um, what we ended up doing was having, so if the, I'm standing in front of the class and the students are all facing me, we had the deaf student at a right angle to the other students and the deaf attendant on the other side of the classroom. So they're facing each other with me in their lateral vision and the rest of the students here so that their field of vision was sort of 180 with all of the people. And um, yeah, and that student hasn't been back in the classroom since we're no longer allowed to take our masks off. Well, I guess we'll cross that bridge when, when she comes back to class. Cool, um, thank, thanks Kira and Liz. And like, I guess like one little thing I can plug in there about like the Google Meet, right? Is the captions do work like not perfectly 
And um, as Kira was point, uh, quick to point out, like they are like Eurocentric, right? But they work really, really well. Like it's pretty incredible that it's the thing that we can even do at all. It's so, amazing. Um, yeah. And I find I often get frustrated because it's it, it will make mistakes. But the deaf attendant who is used to not having any language at all is just like, no, she's like, no, I get it. She's like, I can I can read between the lines or if there's a mistake, like she she knows how to, she's been doing this her whole life without speech to text, you know, so. Mm -hmm. it, I usually read along uh, to make sure that it's picking up what I'm saying. And if it's something really crazy out there, I'll repeat it. I'm like. No, that's not yeah. what I said. <laughs> Just because it could really uh, pick, you know, uh, interpret it uh, quite differently if you yeah. don't speak really clear. Yeah. And it gives us some jokes too. We have a student named Anastasia, and it, the Google Meet thinks her name is Anesthesia. <laughs> we have a student named Katya, and it thinks her name is Ketchup. <laughs> like, so we just we get some laughs out of it too. Mm. Anyway, that's pretty. Funny. Thank you. Um. And it's just interesting to me too. So like this student, right, for context, like um, they're in a, like they're in a, like the largest class they've ever been in. And it's just interesting to me that they've come to, to like a social integration program, which is like, it's a specialized setting, right? In an inclusive setting, but it's like they're in a large group of um, students with other students with disabilities, but there's like this strong sense of community. I remember like Steph, as I segue to you, Stephanie and I met a student who is applying to our social vocational lab next year. And we, she came in and her mom explained to her like, you know, like when you're here, like you don't need to explain to people about your disability anymore. They just, they just get you and they just welcome you. You can be yourself. And I was just like, oh, you know, and she's coming from like an inclusive setting, being integrated with the students, but it wasn't inclusive. She wasn't, inter you know what I mean? So I'm just like, that kind of killed me. And I'm, I'm seeing that with what you're saying right here, uh, Kira. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Ju Julie, something to add? And Kira. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say too, this is giving me a lot of hope because we had a, a student come in uh, just to see our program and this is a student that's blind. And we were freaking out a little bit because we we're like, we don't know uh, how to teach somebody who's who's blind. I don't know the right terminology. I don't know. I, you know, I have no idea. It's not something that we've been trained on. And um, yeah, it gives me hope to know that you're doing this and that you, you know, gone outside of your comfort zone and, and made it amazing. Sounds like it's really successful and everybody's it's, learning. So. I mean, for, from our end, I think I will like it was very intimidating because I knew that deaf culture was very very different than hearing culture and I knew that I was probably going to mess up and that um but I realized that like society is just so not deaf friendly that basically anything we were doing the the attendant was just so grateful for and mm -hmm. it, it made me sad a little bit because I was like wow you should be able to expect this but um, I did get feedback from somebody who knows the student who she grew up in a very language impoverished environment because her she's got a hearing family and um, they just never learned to sign so she did not she just does not have any communication like she cannot communicate with anyone in her family and I've been asking her if they do google image searches if they do typing but it's really like they don't she doesn't have if she doesn't come to school she doesn't have conversations with anyone so um, my goal is to just engage her as much as possible like at the beginning of the year she was interrupting all the time and I realized it was because she is not used to being listened to and so she's not used to paying attention to people talking because no one's ever talking to her um but anyway someone who knows knew her when she was younger recently had a conversation with her and said to like mm -hmm. someone else that her language had really really improved in the six months since she'd been in the program and I mean, that whole time I was just like fumbling. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what she was capable of. I didn't know what she was understanding. I didn't know what she was saying because even in ASL, her language is very limited. Like the hearing interpreters, we realized quickly that there were some who understood her, but many could not say what she was saying because her languages were very limited. There was a lot of stuttering and such. So anyway, I could talk forever. I will stop. <laughs> <laughs> 
I just wanted to let you know, I also had a few visually impaired students over the years that I had the same concerns coming in. I don't know how to adapt towards this. I don't. And the MAB have given me so much support. They've come in, they've done trainings with my teachers. They've offered me trainings. When I've had questions, I've called the mobility specialist. Um, they even have integration agents um, who work specifically with this population. So they have a wealth of expertise and they're happy to share it. So if you don't have any connection, I'd be happy to to give you a name and, and and put you in contact with somebody if you like. Okay. Thank you. This is why I like these groups because we're not alone. Even though I feel alone and on an island most time in the building, <laughs> this is really nice. So thank you. I really appreciate that. I also have a contact at the at the Constance Lethbridge, who is deaf, who has given me um, uh, information videos on how to teach a student who is not only deaf but also intellectually impaired. So if anybody wants those either that person's name or those videos like Stephanie yes, maybe if you want them Stephanie H I could share those videos with you okay thank you so much uh for that Kira so so interesting um and uh yeah I I'm just so impressed with how you and Liz have sort of pulled together to be able to you know make make uh the learning more accessible to to your student um and it's a very specific thing but I'm glad that you know there's something we can all take from that um, so Stephanie Blanchfield, the floor is yours. The Zoom room is yours. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I also just want to super quickly say that I'm so stoked that Kira's back this year, but extra stoked that she's back because I was teaching her class last year. And I just feel like you and Liz are like the best team that could have had this situation in your classroom. And I'm also just slightly grateful it wasn't me. So <laughs> love you guys. Um, OK. So I'm going to share in the chat the link to my nowhere near as exciting as Kira's Google Slides presentation so that I don't have to share my screen so that I can continue to look at human faces while we do this, if that's okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my um, far less exciting thing to talk about today um, is chunking. And the reason that I chose this is twofold, A, because it has um, totally changed the way that I, like the way that I teach in person is completely different. I've realized in the way that I'm teaching online. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I um, am teaching in a new program and the students are writing exams. So as I said before, I'm teaching in an SI SVI hybrid program. So we're doing the SI curriculum and at the same time, the SVI uh, courses. Um, right now we're online two days a week and in person three days a week. So basically this is just something that I've like stumbled upon. I didn't necessarily have like the goal of chunking my lessons more online. I just kind of have figured out that this is what works best. Um, so if you look at like the sample schedule that I put on, it, I my schedule when I'm in person is generally like we'll do an activity for 45 minutes to an hour. And when we're online, we're not doing anything for more than half an hour. Like basically it's like 20 minutes and then we move on to something else. And it was, it kind of came from the fact that I realized that the student's attention span when we're online is half what it is when we're in person. Um, a lot of my students have expressed that they're distracted by everything in their environment, like snow plows going down the street are distracting. And I, I wasn't aware of how much the environment affects their learning. And so I found that the more, the smaller I made the lessons, the more they participated. And not only the more they participated, but the more meaningful their participation was. Um, and I think that attention, like difficulty with an attention span online is not a problem that is like isolated to our environment. I think that students across the board feel this. Um, and so that's kind of when I started to explore the actual benefits of chunking a little bit more. So I'm super fortunate because my students are really independent when they're using their technology. So we toggle between Google Meet and Google Classroom assignments on in classwork. They'll do complete Google Forms. They will work on Google Slides presentations, Jamboard simultaneously with being on Meet, which like is a heaven sent. Like I'm like every day, I'm like, thank goodness they can do this because it makes the learning so much more meaningful for them. But I definitely just find in general that chunking activities into shorter bits that make or like more manageable bites, as they say, um, results in higher quality participation. Um, I also 
through like research into chunking have learned that the brain remembers information more when it's broken into smaller bites. And for a lot of my students, this is the first time possibly ever, if not in years that they're writing exams and recalling information. I realized like is a something that they just cannot do without reminders and so what chunking allows us to do is like we learn something in the morning like i'll introduce a concept we'll talk about it in like a global sense but then we'll come back to it later on in like the online learning environment and then i ask them like what did we talk about this morning and how do we make it meaningful for us and then we'll come back to it the next day when we're in person and the more we repeat in these like small pieces and every time we add on a little piece the higher the chances are, I hope, that they will be able to recall and make this learning meaningful and then bring it with them to the exams. Um, in general, I feel like in this new experience of teaching the SVI program, I feel like the education system has failed our students in a lot of ways. They are very unable to recall information that is told to them unless they are walked to the answer. And I was, I mean, some of you witnessed heartbroken when I graded the first set of exams because I anticipated them being a lot more successful than they were. And the reason I think that they weren't successful is because I didn't chunk the material enough. And so I'm hoping, please, like every God that could exist, that this time that they readily write the exams, the fact that we are breaking the material down into teeny tiny digestible pieces and then putting it together like a puzzle that by the time they get to the end, they're all gonna be like, oh, this is what we were doing. And sometimes they have these aha moments and I like so proud of them, um, but I definitely feel like the chunking has made just their learning experience more meaningful, my teaching experience less stressful um, and just their ability to understand and digest the, the, the new curriculum so much um, more easily. So that's it. It's nowhere near as exciting as Kira's stuff. I apologize for that. But chunking has been, I hope, will be my like life-saving tool. That is all. Um, I was just wondering, what's the reason why you're doing exams? Is it to get like a semi-skill or like, yeah. Yeah, so... Our students will graduate with a certificate in a semi-skilled trade okay. so in, in three years. Is it math and French and English that they have to do? They have to pass a basis of sec two. They have to do, yeah, they have to do those three, but they also have to graduate with credits, um, like their stages, but then also they need credits in the SVI courses. Mm, okay. Yeah. Exams to the SVI courses as well. Yeah, like we taught um, reconciling work and personal life in the first half of the year and they completed the it w was ended up being a five week exam. Wow. Okay. So yeah, and it's, a, it's a it's a ministry exam, Julie. So they're non credit, and you can uh, adapt them. Um, but Stephanie, we we gave the exams to the students as is. Yeah, and this time we're planning on doing the same thing. Okay. So, but there's a lot of like room like Matthew's like taught me over the this course of this year so far like they're allowed to see the exam in advance. So like I can't give them a copy of it but we have a fancy new tool where we can show them um oh we have to leave 55 one minute okay anyhow yes so the, yes they're writing real exams okay great and do they change every year just wondering or is it the same one every year no it's the same great thank you Jen you can go <laughs> I was just going to say we made our own and uh, I had an assignment that looked a lot like it and they were open book exams so they were allowed to use that so there's ways around using the ministry exam as well if, if you to make it a little yeah, bit. Yeah the, the definition of the evaluation domain gives you all kind like you can do a research paper for some of the exams if you want to make your students do a research paper you know what I mean so there are other ways to do it um, and, the, and you can use the exam straight up like Jen's saying you can adapt you can rewrite it. Like there's a lot of flexibility. You just have to go by what the definition of the evaluation domain dictates. And it can be open book and they're allowed to bring in notes or memory aid. Yeah. And thank you to the receipt team for all their hard work. You guys are amazing. It's our pleasure. Lots of love. On, on that note, have a very good evening and we we'll hope to see you soon. Stay safe, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye now. Bye bye. Thank See you, you soon.